to all of you in the CSIR Jigasha sixth webinar program in the series. I thank it on to our director, Dr. Shuman Kumari Misraji, for a keen interest in CSIR Jigasha program for our constant support, guidance, and motivation. And uh, to Mr. Shitendu Mundal, as chief scientist and nodal officer of CSIR Jigasha program, uh, and other organizers for giving me this opportunity to interact with you. Uh, in a nutshell, CSIR Jigasha is a student scientist connect program. The ambitious program launched by the government of India uh, for a new India mission, uh, which is based on scientific social responsibility of scientific community and the research institutes. Uh, presently, the government of India also initiated Ajadika Amrit Mahotsav activities and events as part of the celebration of 75th years of independence. And the government has urged all the ministries and departments to connect with the public, uh, especially the student community, women, farmers in the large number. The event and programs are aimed with the spirit of mass participation for celebrating Ajadika Amrit Mahatsav. So we are grateful to all the heads of the schools and uh, especially the uh, in charge of bottle tinkering labs for their keen presence, uh, kind presence and for nominating students from their esteemed school for attending today's seminar. Uh, today we have with us around more than 60 students, bright students handpicked from different uh, uh, about 11 schools from all over the West Bengal. Uh, we are thankful to all the participants uh, for attending today's seminar. So before I going to but the actual program, let me make some couple of announcements. So all the participants are requested to mute your microphones, please. Uh, we strive to present you a hassle free webinar today. You can unmute when you are requested to do so during the interactive session after the end of this lecture. Uh, all of your questions and queries you can write down in the chat box and we'll pass on to the speaker. And uh, this program is being recorded uh, for use in future for our records and dissemination of knowledge with due permission from our speaker and uh, all the attendees. So my dear students and attendees, ladies and gentlemen, I uh, may request you to put your hands together to uh, for a great round of applause to welcome uh, today's chief guest and speaker, Professor Parag Bhargav. Department of Mechanical uh, Material, Metallurgy, Engineering and Material Science, IIT Bombay. Uh, he is an iconic figure in the field of applied ceramics, both as a teacher and as a researcher, an outstanding orator, I, I believe. And he is dealing with development of various technical ceramics. I am sure that he will be delivering an enthralling lecture on from early humans to infinity, the everlasting partnership with ceramic materials. Thank you so much, sir, uh, for kindly accepting our invitation. I would now request Dr. Shuman Kamani, Mr. Ji, our director. Uh, Saji Shiare to deliver her welcome address on behalf of this institute. Uh, over to you, ma'am. Thank you, uh, Dr. Atiyar. Uh, I welcome all, all the participants who have joined us online, school students, teachers, uh, my uh, CGCRI colleagues and students, and other uh, uh, who might have joined at different forums through this link. And uh, of course, my today's speaker, uh, Dr. Parag Bhargav, Professor Parag Bhargav, I welcome all of you on today's Jigyasa, CGCRI uh, Jigyasa webinar on, uh, on uh, ceramic related and other uh, whatever Dr. Parag is going to talk to today. In fact, uh, all of you know already Atiyar has told that uh, what is CSI Jigyasa? It is a it is a basically a student scientist connect program initiative launched by government of India with the objective of new India mission and based on scientific social responsibility that is SSR of scientific community and institutions. While CSI continues to be contributing for several decades for socio-economic development in the country through deployment of its research and development technologies and innovations, it has taken a major initiative to carry forward this Jigyasa program. The main objective of the program is to connect school students and scientists to extend students' classroom learning with a well-planned research laboratory-based learning and the engagement between the student and the CSI scientists to develop a scientific learning ambience in the school. The program includes student residential programs, scientists as teacher and teachers as scientists, lab specific activities, on-site experiment, on experiments, visits of scientists, uh, scientists to schools, outreach programs, science and maths club, 
projects on National Children's Science Congress, etc., and online labs. In the pandemic time, where the meeting one to one with the students are have become limited or rather difficult, I am very much sure that we will be doing in person very soon if the situation in the country improves far better, where it is allowed to come one to one very well. We will be doing it in person also. CGCRI in this pandemic time has focused on creating a virtual interactive science experiments laboratory facility to the science labs in different underprivileged under, under and many other schools in West Bengal and surroundings to enhance the science learning process. CGCRI took lead in providing online course modules under the Atal Innovation Mission. The contents of these modules are being progressively enlarged and widened to give a better coverage. One among these initiatives is also to arrange popular science talks by leading researchers, technologists, and so that our student feel how we can come into science. This is the main. This is the main uh, uh, motive of such programs. So more and more and more people should come to scientific and research development, which is very much required for the growth of the nation. In this series, CGCRI has, uh, uh, today it is the sixth uh, talk. Previously, we have, uh, it, is, it has been delivered by Dr. Hemant Pandey, Dr. Kanchan Chaudhary, Dr. Devi Prashad Duari, Dr. S.K. Vashne, and Dr. Arvind Ranade. I am thankful to all of you who have joined today in our program and very much thankful to Professor Barak Varga for kindly accepting our invitation. We look forward to hear you. Once again, I welcome all who have connected online with us today. Thank you very much. Over to Atiyar, please. Thank you so much, ma'am, for a brief overview and very warm welcome to all. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, I would now request Dr. K. Annapunaji, uh, Chief Scientist of Glass, uh, Specialty Glass Division, CSIR, CGCRI, Kolkata, for making some introductory remarks on CSIR GKSA program. So over to you, ma'am, uh, Dr. Annapunna, please. Thank you, Dr. Atiyar. Uh, uh, respected Director, Distinguished Chief Guest, Professor Bhagava, Dr. Sitendu Mandal, my colleagues, respected teachers, mentors, dear students, Ladies and gentlemen, very good afternoon. I am very much pleased to be a part of this program. I must say, uh, I don't really say what is Jigasa. Already, uh, Dr. Atiyar and Director Madam has already told uh, it is a Student Scientist Connect program of CSAR initiative, uh, which is being now made national wide. Uh, I must say, this uh, program uh, is an auspicious program. Uh, based on its intention to inculcate the uh, which is the inquisitiveness or the curiosity, which is a quest for knowledge in young minds. As you know, uh, science is basically a study of nature. Nature in the, in the sense by knowing the physical phenomena, how it works, what it is, why it works like that. So in the, with this what, why and how, the elements of Jigyasa once takes the advancement. So this means the curiosity always makes the a human being feel now uh, towards the progress. Whenever you get the gain, the in-depth knowledge, the, your advancement will be upwards, means towards uh, forwardness, forwardness will come. And CS, CSIR has been contributing for several decades towards socioeconomic development of the nation. And in this uh, CSIR Jigasa program, uh, the, uh, they have uh, uh, joined hands with the Kendriya Vidyalaya Sankhan to connect with uh, school's children because the young minds, when you make them train to uh, go towards the, uh, the curiosity, then that becomes the seed which can grow bigger and which will uh, give the fruits which may be the uh, making the nation forward. So in that, uh, as it was told, uh, the CSIR has opened its, it is not only that students are connected to the scientists and also CSIR has 
opened its laboratories to the curious students. They can uh, conduct the experiments or implement their curious ideas so that uh, they can see the result of uh, the ideas or uh, the curiosity. So that is one uh, activity that CSIR is increasing. And through this webinars, as now we are in the pandemic and webinars will be making the students being connected to many learned personalities who have achieved uh, something in their, uh, very much in their uh, respective fields and who can inculcate the jignasa or curiosity towards science in the students. And this one with this webinars connecting to a learned person, it is the beginning starting of it. So anyone who are interested, they, they can uh, continue the connect and they can take it forward with more and more uh, relation so that they can learn the science and they can implement the science and they can uh, see the result. So today we are very fortunate enough to have Professor Bhargava and uh, I, I, I am sure uh, students will get benefit out of uh, today's webinar. I wish all the students very uh, best of luck to come up uh, well in their careers and contribute towards the nation's uh, scientific development. Thank you very much and I thank the organizers to giving me this opportunity. Thank, thank you. Uh, thank, thank you so much, Dr. Onapurna, for your uh, brief overview on this Jigasha program. And uh, Dr. Kaushik Vishas, uh, you know, is a principal scientist of CSR Central Glass and Ceramic Research in Kolkata. And he has been a, also a former student of Professor Varga in IIT Khadakpur. So he will formally introduce uh, today's speaker uh, to our esteemed audience. So Dr. Kaushik Vishas, please. Good afternoon, everybody. It is my proud privilege uh, to introduce Professor Parag Bhargava, my teacher at IIT Kharagpur in this forum. He was our very own teacher as well as mentor and inspired us in many ways, stimulating the scientific temper at very early stage of our career. So Professor Bhargava is currently the chair professor, technology and sustainable development and professor metallurgical engineering and material science IIT, Kharag, IIT Bombay. He has done his B.Tech in Metallurgical Engineering from IIT Bombay in 1991 and M.S. Ph.D. in Material Science from University of Alabama in 1996. He did postdoctoral research at Rutgers University from 1997 to 1998. He is engaged in teaching at the IIT's IIT Kharagpur and IIT Bombay for over 20 years and he has guided over PhD, 25 Ph.D. students and more than 100 master's thesis. His group is engaged in different uh, research activities like glass and glass ceramics for dental processes, synthesis of hydroxapatite, shape forming of ceramics, rheology of ink, synthesis of weakly agglomerated nanoparticles, development of silver paste for PV applications. There are around 150 uh, research articles and five patents to his credit. He has many awards like excellence in teaching award at IIT Bombay in 2008 and 2016. The Young Engineer Award of the Year in 2002 from INAE. Besides his significant contribution in the field of glass and ceramics, he has also co-founded three companies and ceramics, a ceramic manufacturing venture company with a joint support from IIT Kharagpur and I am Ahmedabad. Many of us are aware of this company. Metwitch Materials incubated at Sign IIT Bombay a manufacturer of lab equipment and medtech products and Digitent LLP, a dental lab manufacturing dental processes. Uh, Professor Bhargav is also actively involved in many different social works like he has developed an app for malnutrition which is available on Play Store that is Smart Health Baby and he's also running libraries for the underprivileged kids in slums around IIT campus which I also evidenced during my IIT days. So with this a brief introduction, I welcome Professor Bhargav for his talk titled From Early Humans to Infinity, the Everlasting Partnership with Ceramic Material. Over to you, sir. Uh, thank you, Kaushik. Uh, and uh, before I begin, actually, uh, I would like to express uh, that, you know, this is such a nice program, Jigyasa, the, the, in fact, the 
the name chosen for it it's is 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 so nice you know to promote enquiry to promote curiosity among school children and i am really excited and thankful to cgcri uh, you know everybody dr suman uh, dr shitendu mandal dr annapurna and dr atyar and kaushik all of you and others who are involved in organizing for letting me have this opportunity you know and uh, and hopefully share some ideas which excite and spur some curiosity among children so so thanks a lot for you know such a opportunity wonderful opportunity i'm going to start sharing my screen now Are you able to see my screen? Yes, yes, we yes, can sir. see. You can see. Yeah, we can see, sir. Yes. Okay, sure. Thank you so much. So, uh, so again, as I said, you know, I'm really excited to to make this presentation, and I am uh, hoping that you know there are uh, children who would uh, enjoy it. I have kind of. Uh, directed it more towards children of course and uh, you know the the please pardon me all the scientists who are present here who may be aware of most of the things that i wish to speak about in this presentation and uh, towards the end hopefully you know it uh, it will also promote some interaction and uh, i just request if one of you if it's easy enough if one of you can prompt me at around when i have about 10 minutes left uh, in my timing of Uh, one hour that is allotted to me. So, uh, so I'll begin now, and and you can notice that I have uh, you know uh, titled this presentation as from early humans to infinite, infinity being the time you know sort of uh, that that is that is yet to come as well, uh, and uh, and I say that uh, you know we've kind of had an everlasting part or or have an everlasting partnership. We started somewhere you know. when when humans just started to inhabit the earth and and this is sort of symbolic of where we are today uh, also most of you uh, will realize uh, it's not difficult for you to realize that all this that i'm showing here in the background where we are all connected including the fact that i'm able to talk to you has a lot to do with the important role that ceramics have played of course so and i i will hopefully be able to you know bring out more and more aspects of how uh, this connectedness is also arising out of use of ceramics and uh, and the fact that you know where it began and and and, and there is lot more i think exciting uh, things to come which will involve ceramics my email id is here as it was mentioned that if the children want to connect with me or if anybody else wants to connect with me this presentation as i said is mainly you know uh, sort of targeted towards children so i have not put that much of our research work here but again if if you wish to connect you please you are welcome to connect so with this i would uh, go ahead and see uh, just sort of uh, in terms of the theme that i have chosen so so what i wish to say is for example and many of you are aware that you know the from the time uh, our planet earth formed it was a time when when the temperature at earth was exceptionally high and uh, one can realize if you have read uh, that the situation at earth the conditions at earth did not permit any presence of life life of course evolved much later on earth and these are pictures which sort of show you you know at least one can visualize nobody has seen it of course witnessed it but earth was essentially a very hot place with with a, with a lot of you know like uh, magma or you know molten things and eventually over a period of time the earth slowly cooled down okay and and eventually came to the state that we see it uh, today now when to begin with when the earth formed and it is at least believed that uh, it was all molten right it was all molten and and because of the gravity the denser elements which were part of what was uh, what we could call as earth uh, segregated to the center and the lighter ele elements rose to the surface so eventually that was you know leading towards formation of the earth crust 
right? Uh, form it was basically this exceptionally high, you know, heat that was there as part of the core, which led to convective currents within the within the mantle, so to say. So the mantle is between the core and the crust. And that, that led to the crust actually becoming sort of, you know, uh, circulating and becoming part of the man mantle and eventually sort of dissolving into that molten mass. But as I said, with, 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 with passage of time, okay, with all of these phenomena, finally, as you know, the earth cooled down with the, with the heat loss uh, into the space, a thin crust began to form. Although that started to happen, but it is believed that over a period of time, there were a lot of impact, impacts from foreign bodies, meteors and asteroids on the Earth, which would eventually still keep, you know, locally disturbing the, the, the crust and the mantle. So that kept changing the composition. But what is believed and what is well sort of documented was that uh, major part of the earth crust was silicates and and these were the lighter ones you know lighter uh, elements and lighter materials which which sort of floated and became part of the earth crust so a lot of and this is well known that the earth is you know the earth crust is uh, silicon is one of those uh, one of the elements which is uh, you know in higher percentage uh, the other thing is it's worth uh, sort of thinking about that uh, this is what the scenario was, right? How the earth formed, no life is there, everything is quite warm and one can visualize that these were just solidified magma, uh, which eventually gave rise to the rocks and this crust. But, but it is also very impressive to, uh, to sort of visualize that whatever we today that we have, that we use in our daily lives, all of it actually is originating from the earth crust, right? While everybody knows this, but but visualizing it also, you know, is, is very interesting and exciting. Now, um, given the fact that the way the earth formed and from the time when uh, sort of first human appeared on the earth, most of what they had was rocks, clay, you know, uh, if you can uh, call it that way. And, uh, uh, you know, I will justify that, but basically when humans sort of uh, came to the earth or when, when, when life uh, took, took root and, and, and we got, uh, you know, so to say the, 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 the prehistoric human, all that they had for, for themselves at their disposal was primarily ceramics and of course some other life that was evolving. Uh, so from there on, you know, I just want to point out one more interesting fact, which which is uh, worth knowing that in those times, zircon, which uh, most of the ceramists who are here would connect to it, is that uh, you know that this mineral zircon was a very was a very interesting uh, material, so to say, which is which is associated with radioactivity. So the fact that this mineral is associated with radioactivity led us to call it as as a you know earth's little timekeeper for example because you know it was associated with radioactivity one could actually date give a sort of date or a give a time period to which that uh, to which that material belongs so zircon sort of helped in that way help scientists in terms of dating the dating the age of earth and and when certain minerals or materials around the that zircon were possibly formed now, uh, coming back to this idea, like I posted this question, uh, particularly, you know, in view of the fact that we have a lot of students and, you know, if you're, if they're wondering that why do we, or what is it, you know, uh, what are the typical characteristics of ceramics? Like I mentioned, you know, when the earth formed, it was mostly the life that was just beginning to emerge and all, all the other materials predominantly were were ceramics so to say now what are ceramics and and you have seen already i have just said how uh, the earth sort of evolved uh, uh, first i think one of the first things that uh, is worth noting is that the fact that it came from a molten mass and which solidified so of course these materials must be ones which could sustain those high temperatures right otherwise they would possibly you know become gas that could 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 escape the atmosphere at that time there was hardly any atmosphere so 
So most ceramic materials in general, what remain, what you could see on the crust are the ones which can sustain high temperatures and they cool down from high temperatures. And that is one characteristic of ceramic materials that they can sustain high temperatures. Most ceramics and you from your own experience that you would think of, you know, rocks or stones or minerals, for example, you would know that one can associate this characteristic that most ceramics are hard and brittle. We'll come to this later on in the presentation and in terms of the chemistry. So if you are thinking of the chemistry of what exactly these materials are, most of the ceramics, the more common ones would be oxides, but then you have oxides, carbides, borides, nitrides, and essentially if one wants to put it in a very generic sense, one, one usually says that ceramics are combination of metallic materials with non-metals, right? So that is how you can think of these materials. So most, most of these that we actually had when the earth formed and when the sort of prehistoric humans emerged, all we had around them besides the life that was emerging was rocks and minerals, solidified lava, uh, clay and sand and the clay uh, is believed to have come around or you know formed over a period of time by gradual degradation of all that existed before but but you know some of this list of things uh, don't necessarily sound very exciting and i would say maybe they sound in some sense very boring right so our ceramics boring materials i hope i will be able to convince you during the present hour you know, with the presentation that these materials are actually just the other way around. These ceramic materials are quite exciting. They are not boring materials. Um, so to begin with, I want to first come back to the fact that, you know, so this is where we were, you know, sorry, this is where we were. And the human journey started with ceramics very modestly, right? Simple things. So all that they had was, you know, all these uh, materials that had formed by solidification of, of magma, for example. So and and this part I mean is well known to all of you that one, some of the earliest use of ceramics, so to say, that happened by mankind was you know making of some of these tools which they would use for example for hunting and various various other purposes for cutting things and 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 all of that, right? But you can imagine and in those days with no other tools, sharp edge and all of that would require you know, a lot of skill and for example, knowing which rocks could be actually sharpened, you know, to a certain edge without fracturing them. So all of that, of course, was technology of those times. And then one of the other major things which which I think uh, would have led to a lot of interesting, you know, follow ups was the fact that uh, early humans, when they would have discovered that how one can work with these materials, which we call as clays, the fact that you could shape them, okay, the fact that, and all of you know by now when you have seen a potter's wheel or or otherwise seen, uh, you know, in videos that uh, if you work with clays, it's easy to deform them, so to say, plastically, as in I can deform them permanently without it recovering its shape, right? So this was something special about clays, which I guess would have been discovered accidentally in those times. And something else also in the sense that it could have been it or it very likely was an accident that these clay objects when they were exposed to fire, OK, that they uh, changed their properties, right? They became harder and which would have been also a major discovery of those times. But quickly to point out to you, if some of you who are children here would not have known or seen this, this is a electron micrograph of clay. And you can notice that these clays have a very special kind of, you know, geometry, right? You can see that they are like flat plates kind of things, right? And these are a couple of micrometers. So these are much smaller than a human hair diameter, but these are all flat plates like, right? So this ability to, I mean, two things here, the clays are basically silicates and the fact that they, the, the geometry that they have allows them you know and when you sort of mix it with water and there's a water film so they be, be having the kind of geometry that they have they are able to slide over each other and they still maintain some contact right so these the geometry of the clay and their composition which helps to you know interact with water gives them the plasticity so this was something of course was would not have been known at that point of time but more by observation then you can notice this shows, you know, that this material clay based material has been fired at 900. So notice from this how different this looks and at 1300 degrees C it has become, you know, very densified. 
and it develops that strength and what is also well known is that in clays at high temperature you form glassy phase which helps to bond all these particles okay so this was an accidental discovery by humans which which led to so many other things of course right this is a picture of a pot made 12000 years ago and this is even older so so in those days this was a technology right and this was of, of course must have been very very important right now you know this is where we started and and uh, you know sort of going fast forward to where we stand today uh, we have come really far from there where we started and 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 it's really interesting you will see that okay uh, those of you who are not familiar see one of the things is this is a picture of a lava right now what i'm trying to show here pictorially and i have included a lot of pictures so that you know it gives you a feel that while we you know humans have witnessed lava forever from the time the earth uh, formed but in a way and i i say this that in a way we are able to create molten lava in our labs including cgcri the host organization does this all the time making glasses that's part of their name as well right so when i say making lava in labs i am referring to making glass because lava is essentially like you know glass and and you can see how also visually it has certain similarities right so so we are able to control those things in the lab so we re come really far and this is a picture of glass being cast on molten tin so industrially when the glass is made into a flat glass it's called float glass but it's basically made to float on molten tin so that it doesn't go through a very rapid cooling and 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 forms you know very smooth surface and you can see the finished glass you know beautiful uh, glass sheet here on on us uh, on rollers right now the thing is you can imagine how much today you know starting from where the lava is and to understand how to make glass in a controlled way and you know controlling the composition we have come really far right in terms of making glass and we depend a lot on using glass right every day and believe me it's a wonder material as i show you some more slides you will realize how uh, you know what are the wonders of glass and i know you are aware of some of these things for example gorilla glass and that's uh, you know just a picture from i think corning and this is again gorilla glass and it's hard to imagine for a normal glass to have you know put it like on a machine on which you can bend it and it won't break for example so that's gorilla glass for you which is also called toughened or tempered or strengthened and then you must have seen this kind of situation where you know the windshields of a car would not really break into large pieces and fly off and you know sort of hurting humans so it is all of these things have been designed that's that's the amazing part right so one can actually design glasses regular glasses will not be like this you know as you make a glass it would not have any of this character right but you can design it so one one trick that has been developed over the years is by heating it in a certain way by heating slightly rapidly so what that does is because of the properties of glass and i won't go in great details and that curiosity should stay in your mind you should think about it why that happens but if you cool a you know heated glass rapidly it develops compressive stress on the surface and it's so beautiful that all the surface is under compression and the interior is under tension and that is why this kind of a fracture pattern arises when 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 you know it's impacted right and these gorilla glasses there is a, again you know be curious try to figure out yourself maybe but when you have very these are little thicker glasses but when you have very thin glass and you still want to develop this kind of a stress state like gorilla glass which is scratch resistant what is done is you can't do it simply by rapid cooling because it's thin so what you do is you have the glass structure in which there are these ions okay and you exchange these ions by dipping it in a salt bath so you replace smaller ions by larger ions and when you replace it with larger ions it creates a compressive stress on the surface so it gives you kind of you know similar thing but for a very thin glass right lots of other amazing things about glass i mean many of you may know or if you don't know glasses typically are not conducting you know electrically now but if you see today's world you know we can't live with laptops or mobile phones or tv screens and all of these you know have these interesting things you know in terms of touch screens or those displays beautiful displays and all of that right so in all these cases there is something called you know i mean the fact that these glasses are not conducting does not help us if we want to make things like these 
so we want the glasses to be conducting but unfortunately they are not so what we do is or what the scientists discovered over a period of time which is visible in this picture is that you know they developed a coating which is called indium tin oxide it's a, it's again a ceramic remember oxide so if you coat a thin layer of indium tin oxide on glass then the that part becomes conducting indium tin oxide is gives the conductivity so in this picture for example the inside surfaces of this glass are coated with ito but because it's transparent you don't you can't really distinguish and on this side the supply is there and on this side they kind of held a led in between the two surfaces and they are showing without any wire through it it's lighted up that means this glass is conducting and that's because of this transparent oxide so this is an amazing material and it's there in so many of our devices that we use without which these devices will not work right for example in touch screens basically when we touch this display okay and there is a, you know some uh, small i mean small voltage across these uh, glasses with transparent conducting oxide so when we touch it and our finger is conducting it basically you know changes the capacitance locally and it sort of you know prompts an action that needs to take place that is also shown pictorially over here so this is that way really exciting i mean imagine all of this being enabled with with materials which are transparent coated on glass another very interesting application it's not very common possibly because of the cost i can't uh, be sure myself about that part but notice this picture carefully right the top picture you can see everything and at the same time you know you press a button and these glasses literally become opaque they don't allow any light to come in okay and this is uh, something again very exciting of course in this case you will still need that indium tin oxide the transparent conductor because you can see in the picture that you need to you know you need to apply a certain voltage so in this case what is happening is there is a on and off state when you apply a certain voltage there is a ionic movement within this you know this is of course a very designed kind of glass which has multiple layers and these ions which are free to move so when these ion movement happens on a certain side this is the incoming light for example shown in picture here so you can see that the light start to uh, reflect so it becomes darker so you and the beauty of this is you can actually change the extent of the tint you know it need not be completely opaque you can allow partial light to come in and all that so amazing you know applications that have become possible with simply with glass you know which which you know one could say that it started from somewhere you know when you have the lava now this is again very interesting and i think you some of you would have seen this or many of you would have seen these three dimensional patterns in glass and uh, you know something amazing which can be done with glass is that how they create this is that they use lasers for example and focus it on certain depth so you will have you know it will be all computer controlled right and you will focus it at different depths along this you know sort of along a sort of file that is there in the computer which is for this particular pattern and uh, the intense heating locally causes the micro fractures of glass so what you are seeing because once you have micro fractures you know the light will not transmit like it was before right as as it de does in the rest of the regions and you get this kind of beautiful patterns which emerge of course you need very high transparency and highly pure glass to be able to do this so that the scattering doesn't happen another wonder material of course uh, some of you may know part of part of the information here that you know and i always find it so fascinating that imagine these thin glass fibers which are thinner than our hair these are carrying you know all the data for example when I, when we are able to hear each other out i am able to communicate to you definitely the optical fibers are playing a part here right and the more the optical fibers use the greater i mean the greater is the bandwidth right so these are carrying all the data whether it is voice or video and all of that that we that we have today uh, and you can see i mean some of you definitely who are in higher grades but 9 10 11 12 i'm sure you have heard of reflection right or uh, we just uh, i just mentioned that word but in this case for example you know you have a signal which is usually generated by using a laser and the light undergoes what is called a total internal reflection within these fibers and that's how it travels of course it's uh, it's uh, it the signal decays but then there are different ways of you know 
enhancing that signal and there are a number of experts in cg cri on every topic in fact i forgot to mention whether i say optical fibers whether i talk about glass everything every ceramic material you will find experts in cg cri as well who can tell you more about it or you can get to see some of these things there right now these are some amazing things nearly 2 billion people at at any time at any given time this is an estimate are on the internet accessing internet instantaneously and whatever doing calls and everything and it's all possible because of you know this humble glass fiber i mean imagine one thinks of glass as such a simple material but what all it's able to achieve is unbelievable right uh, and this is another interesting comparison earlier for example phone signals primarily were on copper wires so what it says is optical fiber loses only about 3% of the signal over 100 meters while copper wire loses 94% so you can visualize the difference that that uh, it has made of course there are so many other advantages of optical fibers they don't you know for example i mean they they are much longer lasting and uh, they are uh, you know uh, you can't uh, nobody can sort of tap the signal okay uh, in terms of the signal being sent as as light okay uh, now this is i already mentioned but you know one human i mean one sorry one fiber is capable of carrying something like or transmitting something like 25000 phone calls and typically when they will make a cable they will put hundreds of these right so imagine one cable carrying millions of phone calls and this is again you know you can feel the power of glass and ceramics right there okay and there are of course more details on this uh, you know these optical fibers when they are made they are made or designed in such a way that the core of the optical fiber has a certain refractive index and the the cladding or the outer uh, sort of layer which is not separate has a different refractive index which allows this or which makes the light to undergo total internal reflection so all of that has been you know imagine all of this has been developed over years of course a lot of research is involved from the side of scientists to come up with these kind of things and constantly they keep improving right and now in terms of making of the optical fibers typically uh, the idea is that they first you know try to make a what is called a preform it will be like a solid glass rod and um, and what is done for making optical fibers is that they use these uh, chemicals silicon tetrachloride and germanium tetrachloride the reason to use these is that you would get, you know when you decompose these materials you get very high purity materials right so you will get high purity sio2 silica and high purity germanium oxide which is then converted into glass so you you basically form a preform preform meaning this rod which will be then used for making the the optical fiber right and uh, the core as i said earlier that the core composition primarily contains silica with different amounts of for example in this case germania to increase the refractive index of the fiber you know because we want to create the core and the clad this is just a number right so something like 147 million kilometers of global optical fiber production has happened and i and it continues to be produced in large quantities now this slide shows you this picture okay just so that you can get a feel here those precursors are being sent this silicon tetrachloride germanium tetrachloride you can adjust the ratios through certain kind of sophisticated flow control devices and you you know that way you control how much germanium goes in and you basically produce a core rod okay which is also called the preform like i said and once you have a preform you generally collapse it because this would be hollow and you know how it is deposited so you collapse you make a solid kind of a rod and that solid rod is taken so these are pictures real pictures and there's a like a optic fiber drawing tower so you are basically drawing and you know the glasses have this characteristic i don't i don't have time to go in detail but they have this characteristic that they soften over a temperature range so they are you can pull you know or you can make fiber out of it so schematically it's shown here this is your preform and you know you have it heated and you kind of you know draw thin fiber out of this you know so based on volume conservation you can calculate the preform diameter length how much kilometers or whatever of a fiber will it give and when you make it like this as it comes out you also continuously coat it with a polymer so that it does not develop any damage because it's a it's a otherwise it's a you know material which is very sensitive to any defects but the fact that this is defect free you coat with polymer you are able to spool it and this is what gives us all the communication that that we are able to you know engage into 
this is one thing i wanted to intentionally put because cgcri being the host institution and it's an impressive you know work and it is it's it's so useful for the country that's at cgcri i know for years and dr shitendu himself is involved of course with all the leadership at cgcri the directors involved in you know doing this for the country that they have been making this radiation shielding glass which is which is a very special glass uh, composition with i think excess lead in it um, which helps to protect you know uh, in various situations from nuclear and x ray radiation so it's not only uh, of strategic need but even otherwise it is needed even for you know other requirements for example wherever you handle all these kind of uh, radiation now uh, why i say and you will realize why i'm saying this so all that i talked about until now was majorly about glass so i want to now talk to you about uh, ceramics and those of you who are not aware i will say something that why am i going why am i sort of distinguishing glass from ceramics even though they are actually part of the same family right so uh, so here it is so while one thing okay one thing uh, so special i mean one thing sorry so commonly known for glasses is that the glasses are transparent so i am taking this theme but i'll explain to you the other parts as well so glasses are typically and we know uh, glass are transparent but generally the impression with when i talk to many many students is that ceramics are also transparent and and you know because the impression of what people think of ceramics is something which where they don't see transparency for example when you think of crockery not always transparent unless it's just glass when you think of floor tiles and all these things are not transparent right so what is what is the difference between glass and ceramics so one sort of in a very simple form of course one can talk about it in lot more detail is that glasses are what we call as amorphous and i'll just say why i mean or what it means while ceramics are crystalline so i think even in schools you would have heard of what is it to be crystalline the word crystalline refers to if you look at this picture it refers to both you know short range and long range order when i say short range when you look within the neighborhood of an atom silicon and then you have four oxygens around so silicon tetrahedrons you can't see the fourth one in this view and and you see that there's a long range order it looks similar you know you can if you identify a unit cell you can identify i mean sorry you can translate it in three dimensions and it's it's the same within a within a given crystal while in this case when you when we say amorphous which glasses are amorphous you have short range order of course that is preserved anywhere but in long range you will see you know all kinds of you know differences exist right it's it it doesn't it doesn't have that you know sort of unit cell which you can uh, translate in three dimensions and thus generate the structure so glasses are amorphous uh, and crystals are you know uh, uh, crystalline materials or ceramics are rather, sorry crystalline which have a ordered structure long range order the other thing very quickly i wanted to say is those materials which are crystalline also have these regions which are called grains in which the orientation is similar so this is one crystal another crystal another crystal so most of the ceramics most i would say unless we make it intentionally are used in a polycrystalline form where you have these crystals or grains as part of a single solid and the boundaries between these crystals are these grain boundaries okay now coming to the other thing that i which i posed can ceramics be transparent see we know glasses are transparent but but Uh, you know uh, it's very interesting and i'll just say it quickly the reason why a material for example a crystalline material in this case ceramic is transparent is that it does not have mechanism to absorb light and it doesn't scatter the entire light okay it doesn't kind of reflect the entire light away right so if it so primarily if it doesn't have a mechanism to absorb light it, it allows light to pass through and what decides that if some of you are students of or learning physics that the band gap of the ceramics is in the higher range uv range okay it's higher so it doesn't absorb visible light and if you make ceramics in highly pure form okay and if it does not have any pores to scatter light then it allows light to transmit you know high transmission so this is an example of a sodium vapor lamp where both glass and ceramics are being used which is very interesting so you have outer envelope of glass and inside you have another tube so this is all sealed from outside and you you have another tube into which sodium is come you know confined and when you light it up there's a arc and the sodium vapor gives you the is responsible for the light so if you did could not have a ceramic which is transparent 
of course you can't use metals here because they are opaque and you can't use any other material which will not be able to uh, sort of you know which will react with sodium so transparent ceramics make it happen that you can have the sodium vapor lamps another example again a crystalline ceramic uh, for dental braces okay you can almost not see them so because light goes through another example just as we are on the subject of transparency is the fact that you know uh, i mean these are not the best of the applications war is not a great thing but it's a reality but but uh, you know but for defense you know a lot of these vehicles are fitted with these uh, materials which can take bullet impact and they have to be of course transparent so there are these tra uh, not these are not glasses okay these are crystalline ceramics for example in this case aluminum oxynitrite and there are others you know magnesium aluminate spinels which are polycrystalline but for the reasons that i told you you know highly pure materials and no porosity when you make them they become transparent they allow light transmission and the fact that uh, i mean and, and i can't go in great detail but many of these crystalline materials full, you know fully dense and having high hardness can actually resist impact of bullets of course if i mean if they, it keeps getting those imp bullet uh, you know shots fired then it, it can't but but it's designed that way that one can actually react to a first few bullet impacts and because these are hard materials they blunt the bullet in, you know and would not allow them to go through right so this is another example another example of a material where you can as i explained you know if you don't have porosities and all of that and if you make pure and fully dense materials then you can get certain materials like in this case zirconia which looks after having the cuts and all of that and after first making it dense it looks exactly like uh, sorry diamond and if i were to show you in real you won't uh, if i show you both materials in real you won't be able to easily distinguish which one is a real diamond and or which one is zirconia of course if you are a smart person you will maybe measure the density and you will say oh this is the one which is zirconia because diamond and zirconia have very different densities and the reason why zirconia one is it's transparent the second is it uh, if you you know the fact that it has zirconium atom which is a high atomic number element so the refractive index is high and that is why it kind of resembles diamond this is another example of some transparent ceramic it's a laser quality transparent ceramic it's called neomium doped yttrium aluminum garnet and these are used for making lasers and there uh, these transparent ceramics are also used in cameras to get materials with high refractive index now i i'm sorry i'm switching to another theme and i'm going a little fast just to be able to cover most of the things Uh, and this is an example completely different from transparent materials now i've switched back to the fact that you know we were talking about these materials which can resist bullets so there are number of other materials which can stop bullets but the one interesting thing which i'll show you in the next one or two slides is that there are people who are also talking about some liquids which can you know sort of stop bullets maybe not all but but still some of them now as i explained already why ceramics are used because they are hard materials they will tend to blunt the bullets maybe or you know sort of bring a damage and usually they will not be used alone the ceramics will be backed up by a polymeric material which is called kevlar so that this material just does not fly away if it uh, does form some fragments and that's why that and that's how you can get some protection so these are like for example boron carbide ceramic tiles which are very light so that our soldiers if they wear the you know armor they don't have to carry very heavy weight for example steel also works but steel is much heavier right so these things are one of the hardest some of the hardest materials boron carbide and it can actually uh, stop the bullets right now this is a material which is a liquid like i said and which can actually you know people have examined for its use to uh, sort of you know uh stop the bullets and i mean unfortunately i don't have the time to show you the video but the beautiful characteristic of this material it is called a shear thickening material by the way and what uh, one can make this shear thickening materials by using some ceramic nanoparticles like this is shown here and what happens in a shear thickening the word thickening and shear if you think about these words so as you shear this material as you try to deform this liquid it thickens and it becomes harder and this picture i think conveys that very well if you see that these are different compositions but this is a liquid so when you reach a certain composition and you let this stone fall over it it actually does not allow it to go through because it just hardens and that's the whole concept of how to maybe try to stop bullets 
and this is another very nice thing which a lot of people do a demo that on they fill these shear thickening fluids in tanks and if you run over it like if you have a very high shear if you impact it you know then you will not sink in but if you just walk very slow then you start sinking in because that's the whole phenomenon of shear thickening now i go to some another theme where we look at different different applications where the hardness of ceramics has been utilized not i mean think look at this this is again very impressive applications these are all ceramics with which ball bearings have been made and i know many of you would have seen ball bearings or played with those ball which come out of ball bearings but these are not metals these are ceramic ball bearings and you know their applications can can be in places like for example helicopters and windmills where very high performance is required you know where the wear resistance is guaranteed and ceramics being hard would not wear out so easily the next slide shows you again those ball bearing the ball part of the ball bearings and these balls ceramic balls are made out of these kind of powders okay and these are extremely fine powders and this this length for example is 10 micrometer which is like you know maybe 1/5 of our diameter of human hair so and i'll talk about this later if i have time that usually all ceramics crystalline ceramics will be made from powders okay uh this is another example i mean i'm not naming the ceramic but there are there are these machines called water jet which are used to cut all these beautiful patterns machine out beautiful patterns even out of hard materials and the only reason these uh, machines are possible where you have water and sand slurry going at such a high speed and pressure is because you have to use you use ceramic components because metals cannot take that kind of you know these kind of conditions so water jets are possible because of again ceramic components this is a different example completely but of a hard material okay this is you can see a very large component these are basically silicon carbide mirrors so this entire thing is made out of silicon carbide a very hard ceramic and it has been polished to mirror finish and you can probably make some sense out of this that when you have a very hard material and if you manage to polish it to mirror finish because it is extremely hard later on other materials would not scratch it so ceramics in some sense whether it makes you know i mean whether you have heard of this before or not but ceramics make some of the most the best of the mirrors so these silicon carbide mirrors are both proposed for applications on earth as well as in space and when they make mirrors for space they make such structures on the back which which you know minimize the weight so that they can actually fly or they can be as the uh, payloads okay so so these are again very nice uh, interesting uh, materials for uh, space and earth uh, telescope mirror applications another example of ceramics and hard materials again silicon carbide is involved here but i'm not going to detail but apparently ferrari which makes these cars which travel at very high speeds uh, they introduced these ceramic disc brakes quite some time back and i think they still uh, have these ceramic disc brakes in the cars they are of course expensive because of the Uh, not so easy uh, sort of processing and they have lot of advantages in terms of you know very long lasting of course you know the performance is amazing you know in terms of the stopping power because these cars are going at very high speeds they don't heat up because the thermal conductivity is excellent and so many other things and of course they are corrosion resistant being ceramics so again very interesting application this is a application which each of us uses every day but believe me it's not such a easy thing to make and this is you can see this is a ball point pen roller and you can see that this is this length is about 100 micrometer to make a perfect sphere okay of a precise dimension you know perfect sphere of a precise dimension such that you know every time it fits into that cavity and gives us that ball point pen is not easy because these materials are very hard so imagine hard materials having to be made into spheres so there's a lot of technology that goes into making these ball point pen rollers another example where hard materials are used these are called wire drawing dies and the insides of these will either have ceramic or inserts or diamond coatings for example and they will use these kind of things to make wires metal wires so from one side you will feed the the larger diameter for example rod and on the other side it is pulled and then it reduces in diameter and that's how you keep reducing it you know in stages and you make metal wires out of it so without these hard wear resistant materials it's not possible now i come to a different uh, aspect see typically i don't know if you have seen this observe this uh, 
that metals are quite machinable. You can put it on machines and you can shape them just simply by machining, right? But, but the question that I'm asking here is that ceramics, which are, of course, known to be hard and brittle, are they possible to machine just like metals? And I'll answer that question in a little while. Um, but the first related question is, what makes ceramics brittle? We know that they are brittle. So it is explained in, in this particular, you know, schematic. Imagine that, you know, the being brittle means if a crack is generated or if, if a crack is existing in a ceramic, it is not able to tolerate. It just breaks very easily. So that is being brittle at, the, at this time when we are, I mean, in the context of the discussion here. So imagine a sharp crack, okay, or a crack there in a material. Now we are comparing one is a brittle or a material like ceramic and metallic material, which we also call as ductile. Now, without going into great detail, what I want to tell you is that in metals, when you have a sharp crack or in any material, sorry, around the sharp crack, imagine this material is loaded, you know, it's being used, so it has some load, right, experiencing some load. So what is well known is that at the crack tip, there's an intensification of stress. Imagine if I were to apply a 10 kg load at the crack tip, it could be of the order of hundreds of kg equivalent load, okay. So it's called stress intensification, but when you st have stress intensification at the crack tip, in metals, what is shown schematically is metals are known to be closed packed structures. So the atoms can, you know, slide or uh, the, uh, the material can slide on the slip planes. And because under high stress, the slippage happens, so this crack from being sharp becomes rounded. And what is well known, okay, and those calculations exist that when it becomes rounded, the stress intensification at the crack tip comes down and the crack does not want to propagate, okay, because the stresses come down. In ceramics, even if you have dislocations, those, that, I mean, sorry, I, I'm invoking a word, sorry, which, which you may not know, but let me just put it that way that in ceramics, the slippage does not happen. And that is why the high stress leads to crack becoming elongated. And as the crack becomes longer, the stress intensification further increases. So that's why in a ceramic, the crack simply propagates and propagates rapidly. And that's why these materials are brittle. So people sometimes use tricks to reduce their brittleness. Okay. So these are some tricks. Okay. Without going into great detail, maybe I'll show you, share one. I mean, some things like sometimes people add fibers, you know, some reinforcements which will hold the, which will not allow the crack tip to open up, okay, or they try to somehow dissipate that energy or the stress at the crack tip in different ways. Sometimes people have also used this strategy that the crack, I mean, they put all these second phases, but they deflect the crack out of the primary direction. And all of this, you know, reduces the crack stress intensity at the tip and thus the brittleness is reduced. And this is one, you know, really amazing sort of, um, discovery or a material which was developed you know maybe in the 1960s it was called transformation toughening and it's very commonly shown in a material called zirconia with which we uh, see that the knives ceramic knives are available they are made of zirconia and there's something interesting happens like in context of the crack so when you have a crack tip and when you have a high stress intensification around the tip so the material this zirconia material which is in a certain crystal structure tetragonal crystal transforms to another crystal form okay around the crack tip where there's an intensification of stress and that transformed material has a higher volume so it basically because higher volume material is generated so it generates net compressive stresses and that is why this material behaves as a higher toughness material and because it has a higher fracture toughness this material can be used to make these ceramic knives now, I, I, I'll skip this uh, in the interest of time. This is a material from nature. It is called nacre. And it is well known that it has such structure. And because of this layered structure and that idea of, you know, deflecting the crack, this material has a very high toughness, even though otherwise it is uh, expected to be brittle. Okay, it, it does not fracture that that easily. Now, one one material which which scientists designed, which which has a you know which which it does not have the brittleness or reduced brittleness, let's call it that way or higher toughness, and that becomes machinable. So you can see these pictures; they are conveying that this ceramic can be machined, and what is inside the material is basically reveals you know why is it so magical? Otherwise, ceramics are not machinable, right? So in this case, what they have done is they have created like a glass in which some crystals are formed. 
so they first make the glass then they heat it in a in a i mean and there are you know lot of underlying reasons why that happens but you form crystals and imagine when i try to machine this material which means some crack will you know propagate so when a crack propagates through the glass and it runs into the crystal that crystal kind of let's imagine it obstructs the propagation of the crack and it deflects it from that direction so instead of the crack going and breaking this material you form machining chips so you have this uh, machinable glass ceramics one of them is a commercial material which is called makor which is available in the market but very exciting to see you know something a ceramic which can be machined so now i am coming to the high temperature capabilities and how they enable different applications so i don't know whether you have seen this in pictures but these are some amazing things you know and all of us use all kinds of metallic components including steel okay and steels are melted you know handled at something like 16 i mean 1700 degree c very high temperature so molten steel now what i'm trying to show in this picture is uh, when you have containers of course metal containers cannot sustain those kind of temperatures to hold molten steel so what will come to the rescue like we've been talking about ceramics are high temperature materials so these are called refractories materials in general which can sustain very high temperatures are called refractories and these refractory bricks are lined are lining all these containers you know into which the molten metal is being uh, held and then you do rest of the processing whether pouring it out you know to uh, to to solidify into certain shapes and 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 all of that so again if there were no refractory materials you know it will be very difficult to actually process steel for example so that's the high temperature capability into action the other very interesting application here is that of turbine blades and these kind of turbine blades are used in aircraft engines also now there is a technique called investment casting which apparently i'm and i'm not entirely sure but it is believed that this technique evolved in india long back and the lot of bronze sculpture in the country uh, very early you know hundreds of years ago or maybe i don't know 1000 year or more ago uh, was produced by this technique called investment casting and this technique just to describe very briefly what happens is whatever shape you want to make for example in this case turbine blade you make those turbine blades or this shape in form of in i mean in exactly in the same shape but in wax okay and it's possible to shape wax manually or these are done by machines once you shape wax in uh, in these forms the whichever form you want it in final shape you then dip it in different ceramic slurries okay particulate based suspensions and you coat them okay dry powder slurries and all that and after coating it will look like this then you take this and you bake it and you basically melt out the wax so wax thing is contained inside so wax goes out and you bake it so you harden it and then later on you you know you keep it heated and you bring hot metal and you pour it from the top and when you pour it of course you will form the solid shape so this is how these things are made so it's very impressive how not knowing many many things systematically also people you know thousands of years ago were also making all these amazing you know bronze sculptures and all of that one more thing in turbine blades in aircrafts they also need these turbine blades to be hollow so what is done is not only this but they also use a ceramic core inside these and then they cast around it so this is a cut section showing that when a ceramic core is used the inside uh, has a certain complicated geometry which is hollow for all kinds of you know cooling arrangements and to allow gas to flow from the turbine blades so very amazing technology this in uh, in investment casting but not possible without ceramic this shell is ceramic this core is ceramic okay all of that now these are again some very impressive material these are you as you can make out these are like filtration materials you know porous materials and what they do is just like you know how we sieve our tea jab chai banate hain to hum chai chhante hain usi tarah in this case when you have molten metals and when you need a very clean metal casting so you put that in between and it allows you know the metal to pass through and retains a lot of impurities and what you get which you cast is a cleaner metal which has basically higher strength so again high temperature materials enables that and there are other characteristics also required but very interesting how these are made you know if some of you get curious these are called reticulated foams by the way and these are made from uh, polyurethane sponge so you start with a polyurethane sponge and you finally make these rigid highly porous ceramic foams okay another example of a high temperature material this is basically a silicon single crystal 
growth uh, which has been you know made you know as shown schematically here it's you know uh, control uh, solidified in a controlled manner but you need a crucible into which the silicon has to be held the molten silicon and that should be highly pure and it should take all that high temperature and should not you know lead to for example should not lead to impurities and should be able to sustain all that load so typically silica crucibles are used and this is a very very high value addition you can imagine the the single crystals of silicon are the basis for all our uh, you know processors computer chips and also for solar cells you know you get silicon wafers out of this going to another aspect uh, uh, and i am going to talk show you applications of ceramic fibers which are typically thinner than our hair okay and this is something it so happens this is something pictures from what was done in our lab and i know cg in cgcr i also there has been a lot of activity on ceramic fibers earlier but these ceramic fibers are made in a simple machine and all of you know what this is so this is a very simple machine of course the processing is not so easy but these are how the ceramic fibers look like when made and notice this this is 20 micrometer this length thinner than the hair half or one third our uh, hair diameter and these are ceramics which can take very high temperatures maybe 1800 degree c and these enable many many applications for example you can see you know they can take very high temperatures they can be used to make you know inner lining of furnaces which are very light and can go up to high temperatures then fiber based material not these but fiber based materials have also been used for making these tiles for space shuttle so the whole space shuttle is lined with these kind of tiles which have these fibers and these structures basically this fiber based you know boards because they retain so much of air gaps you know they have very low thermal conductivity which is what you want so when the space shuttle re enters the atmosphere because of the frictional heat it will get very high uh, temperature at the surface but because it has exceptionally low thermal conductivity it does not burn the metal or does not you know lead to total you know collapse or uh, burning up of the metal structure and another very interesting uh, the way these materials behave these particular materials fiber fibrous silica fused silica based materials notice that they are heated to high temperature but because of their special properties somebody is able to you know hold it at the edges okay so something very very exciting to see and to think about again these fiber based materials are used to produce all kinds of insulation textiles which help you in handling all these industrial situations another very interesting example and that you know materials are different in all of these cases but these are these are these are all uh, high temperature alumina fibers which are being used now in uh, aircrafts and apparently this is a component which i have in another slide later on also which is part of the aircraft engines which is recently apparently recently been inducted into use because ceramics for a long time were not used in aircraft engines Uh, this is another uh, application slightly different one like i just showed you turbine blades a while ago all these aircraft turbine blades in the hot section you know where the main compressor is okay uh, are coated with these ceramic coatings and the reason why they are coated with ceramic coatings these coatings are of low thermal conductivity they are called thermal barrier coatings so they basically allow the engine to operate at a higher temperature so even when the engine temperature is pushed higher because these are thermally insulating you know coatings so they don't uh, they keep the temperature of these metallic turbine blades restricted otherwise you know that they have a chance to get damaged so there are a lot of special uh, methods by which these coatings are produced for example these are the coatings you know columnar structure which which are able to talk, tolerate all the thermal cycling but there are a lot of interesting you know uh, things about uh, the technological aspects of making these coatings but every aircraft engine the turbine blades now have these ceramic coatings which make all these things happen these are two components one of them you had seen in the other picture this is another component i think this is silicon 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 carbide fiber and silicon carbide matrix based component which is also being used in uh, aircraft engines now it's called the exhaust cone again these are relatively newer uh, happenings you know where ceramics have entered the aircraft engines and they offer a lot of advantage in terms of both the weight savings and also the temperature at which the aircraft engines can operate uh, now a related thing uh, in in the sense that these are light materials they can be thermal insulators or porous ceramics and again this was something which was done in our lab earlier so one of our students used uh, egg white proteins to make uh, this is long time ago uh, that person now is a professor in iit kharagpur uh, 
so uh, egg white proteins were used to make these uh, foamed ceramics and you can see that these are all closed cells so these can be very insulating but then if you use different materials and different processing like in this case reetha which you may be aware was used by people earlier like you know as as a shampoo at homes natural material so the surfactant from this has been used again to make ceramic foams but the structure that you get is very different highly porous another phd student uh, did this so highly porous materials now they can be used for other applications for example and you can see some similarity between this structure and here this is the structure of bone an electron microscopy image and you can see that this particular part of the bone which is called the cancellous bone is highly porous and all this porosity you know allows for all the you know the 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 blood vessels to pass through and all of that but the fact that there are similarities in this structure means if you use synthetic bone material like hydroxyapatite you can try to simulate or try to make some similar structures uh, and and again this is shown here right the dense part on the surface and the porous part inside and we also tried to bond you know a dense part to the porous part to make uh, structures which were very similar to the bone also if you make these materials with closed cells like i showed earlier that you can make these excellent you know thermal insulators so on one side you may have several hundreds of degrees you know 1200 degree on the other side the temperature goes only up to 150 160 degrees so very nice thermal insulators just by making ceramic foams finally we made a machine in our lab to try to make these in large quantities and this is another interesting example just coming out from you know more from nature so when you burn coal in power plants which is still being done hopefully that will discontinue but what you see these in the burn uh, what is the ash that is left after burning the coal you see these beautiful materials which are called xenospheres which are basically hollow spheres and there's a lot of interesting applications because they also become barriers of heat and sound both so they are being used in construction a lot and many other applications where you need low thermal conductivity so these xenospheres again are very interesting structures uh something about renewable energy okay and i'll tell you what is the connection with ceramic this is all basically these all conductors are made by silver paste but believe me the whole solar cell this making the you know the finger uh, current collecting fingers bus bars and to collect all the power that is generated in this silver paste the key role that is played is by glass if there was no glass of a particular kind you know that contact would never be established so this glass has there are a lot of mechanisms which are known of high how it helps to establish the contact it basically etches out this blue colored material which is a insulating material silicon nitride firstly it etches out and secondly glass allows reprecipitation of silver this is this thing represents reprecipitation of silver right next to silicon and within it and that's how it makes the electrical contact very very interesting but i wanted to show you the fact that the glass makes that happen so we make the silver and this is from our lab we make the silver we make the glass powders we make the paste and we print on solar cells very very important in application in current times right with the renewable energy emphasis this is another application of silver and glass if you notice any time if you have not noticed look at the back side of your car okay many cars at least 50% of the cars have these kind of lines which is a defogger when you press a button it will clear the glass so this is basically screen printed silver with glass powder in it that is how it bonds to the wind i mean the 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 glass of the car right again very interesting application these are some things you know i mean these pictures are of course not ours but these are dye sensitized solar cells which are see through kind of cells and these use nano titania the connection with ceramics one of the connection with ceramic of course it is based on glass but nano titania is used and we did that work in our lab we made those dye sensitized solar cells using nano titania slurries uh, this is another nano material by the way which is uh, zirconia and we again done some work in our lab where you can notice this is 20 nanometers it starts from somewhere here this zircon remember we talked about zircon so we get zircon i mean other companies get zircon sand okay from the beach sand and they make some zirconium chemicals out of it from which we are able to make all these nano zirconia particulates and then using these nano zirconia particulates we make these discs which this can be machine finally you know you get all these shapes and finally you get these dental crowns and these shapes and size that you need it out uh, that you need it in is already you know supplied by the dentist who scans the oral cavity of a patient so so these things being made 
directly go eventually and fit the patient's oral cavity and and you know they are some of the they are not some they are the best dental crown materials now known and they look absolutely like natural teeth with using all the you know pigments and 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 the and the colors this is an application of zirconia again where uh, you know oxygen sensors are made using zirconia this is not zirconia another material which is very old by the way humans i think porcelains have been around for now several hundreds of years and this is one of the still a very popular material for dental crowns and this porcelain is basically first uh, i mean metal crowns are made and the porcelain is coated over this and you know then heat treated so very interesting application i'm going to i'm going to skip because i'm not sure how much time i have consumed uh, uh, but but we'll quickly wind up try to wind up so this is study on toothpastes and these are you know pictures of you know dental uh, our dental enamel which is being treated with different toothpaste like the sensodyne so when people develop the sensitivity and you use this toothpaste it basically deposits all these particles uh, which is and which leads to formation of these uh, you know natural crystals also eventually more and more so appetites and that helps to reduce the sensitivity of the tooth and this is another solution which somebody has proposed this is how the human dental enamel looks like and somebody has also shown that you can actually try to grow that in the lab these are again ceramics hip joint which a lot of work has happened already at cgcri and these are dental implants this is a material these are piezoelectrics piezoelectric ceramics which are used in making ultrasound transducers for medical body imaging so these are you know you make a block of ceramic and then you kind of cut it with a saw Uh, fill it with a polymer and that becomes your probe and you know piezoelectric ceramics being having that property that you when you apply a voltage it generates a strain so it sends a sound wave in the body and when the sound wave is reflected from the tissue this material when it receives the sound wave it generates a voltage in different different elements and that's how you generate a body image using these piezoelectrics and the piezoelectric material is again used in all these gas lighters you know so basically when you uh, sort of you know generate a strain it gen i mean when you when you uh, sort of build in a strain into the material it generates a voltage and it sort of breaks down the air gap that's why you see a spark there okay uh, last few things ceramics we know are often known to be insulators i said that early on and these are being used in very very critical application at the same time it's surprising for those of you who don't know even though we use most of the time we use ceramics for their insulating properties but they are also superconductors okay and in 1980s these were very popular oxide superconductors which expel the magnetic field so this is a magnet levitating over a cooled superconductor and you know when you cool them below their critical transition temperature they go to literally zero resistivity okay so they lose all their resistance and that's why they are called superconductors these are some magnetic ceramics okay which are all ferrites Uh, there are lots of ceramics on mobile phones i didn't have the time nor i have pictures to show you but lots of ceramics in mobile phones ceramics in pollution control this is my last part i just want to quickly say like i have talked a lot about ceramic components but how do we make these components and remember those of you children you know younger people who are not familiar everything every ceramic component that you see is made starting from powders and these powders don't look impressive they look like you know maybe wheat flour at least in appearance i'm saying i'm just joking but you take these powders you make these granules which have binders and plasticizers a lot of organics and you finally press these powders like for example it shows schematically a pressed one so you press these shapes that is one of the options and once you press you heat them to high temperatures and it develops those solid uh, ceramic components with grains and grain boundaries like i said earlier The, this is the entire cycle but i don't want to go in great detail you can do dry powder processing or you can take ceramics and make them into slurries and make shapes finally heat them to high temperature to densify this is a process called spray dryer which is the same as what is used for making the milk powders so what i showed you grain granules these are made by spray drying okay once you have the spray drying granules you press them into different shapes like i showed you now this is another process again you can witness it as cgcri if you are there nearby but this is called slip casting this can be done for clay based bodies for making artistic things or for engineering components but you make ceramic into slurries and then you take these gypsum molds you pour them and this is how you know because these molds are porous you get shapes and then these shapes have to be heated at high temperatures to make the component and this is how schematically again it is shown here 
very interesting process these are some slip cast ceramic components there's a lot of possibilities of what you can make with slip casting there's a process called gel, gel casting i won't go in great detail but the, you don't use gypsum molds here you can use dense molds and you basically you know include a monomer soluble monomer in the slurry which polymerizes in situ and you form many shapes so this we had done some of our phd students earlier so you can make all kinds of shapes out of these gel casting so this is again another process and lastly okay sorry uh, you know some of you would have heard that nowadays 3d printing of ceramics is possible so it will machines are very expensive but it makes your life very easy just press of a button and print ceramics and you know thing machines like these are available you can literally print houses that scale to you can go into uh, you know hundreds of micrometers you can make very complex shapes and all of it uh, one of the popular technique i should say is also using of course ceramic slurries but you use lasers to you know cure these uh, these uh, the polymer uh, in which you make the slurry so that's how and you keep lifting the structure that's another sort of technique of you know extruding this material and 3d printing the ceramics but amazing things are happening with technology now you can make things which were impossible to think of by the conventional techniques you know uh, things like these can be also made like we saw ceramic cores and also it's becoming hopefully a commercial reality that you know for example dental implants can be made very quickly with these 3d printers lastly this is my last slide one of the outcomes and and it was already mentioned this is just a picture that you know we have two or three companies which came out in the domain of ceramics also with students one of them is ant ceramics some of you would have heard but students would not have known and this company actually got an award in 2018 by the president of india this is the other company which is in the dental domain it's called digident it's based in indore and they make all these ceramic dental prosthesis so with this i stop and i suppose uh, if we have time and if the organizers permit i can you know take some uh, questions so, so first of first of atyar you are you are me so first so of all please join me please join me for a great round of applause for a amazing talk by professor bhargav very amazing and we are spellbound uh, literally thank you. thank you and sir please give us permission so that uh, we can upload this in the youtube sure, basically to purpose is to make it popularized the ceramics and glass absolutely. can be made popularized sure. through this only so please give us permission and i think there is no question in the chat box so students can uh, raise your uh, hand or you can directly ask the question to professor bhargav uh, please bhargav uh, very good lecture throughout i just uh, glued to the uh, glued to computer even if two people came three people came alle baad mein kar denge so i had option so i had option to mute and uh, talk to them okay Yeah. thank you thank you I so have, i have sent you one uh, whatsapp message you see that okay thank you thank you Many so thanks. much thanks so thank you for the opportunity again you know all of you yeah so i think if there is no questions uh, and I, i i believe everybody has understood uh, i also I at least <laughs> learned so many things from you sir and uh, it's an wonderful experience to listen to you uh Somebody is Someone has written, sir. Email ID. Could you please? Yeah, I'll I'll uh, type it in the chat. Okay, so yeah, yeah. Sir. So email ID. Actually, he has shown in the first slide. Uh, uh, but the email I'm also ID typing possibly. in the chat. Uh, yes. Yeah, of course. Feel free to get in touch with me, and my email ID is also there. I've typed in the chat, but it's there also on the IIT Bombay website. I'll be happy to interact. You know, as it was already said, the one of the objectives of Jigyasa is that the interaction doesn't end here; it, it rather begins here. So, so you know, people, if they like it's, to, you know, it's just touch. an initiation. It's just <laughs> an initiation to this effect. Maybe it will be continuing for the year long till two zero two three because uh, Ajadi ka Amrit Mahotsav is also there, and there are many programs relating to that. and yeah. that belongs to also under jigasa so uh, we are not leaving you it's just an initiation <laughs> to this drive thank you sure. sir thank, thank you very much for uh, for your uh, very informative and and uh, and uh, an energetic talk 
I think it will inspire the students and definitely they'll be enriching with their knowledge base with this topic, with this title, with this deliberations. I okay. think Koushik wants to say something before the proposing vote of thanks by Anirban. Hello, Hello Koushik. Sir. I felt nostalgic actually when I used to attend <laughs> that class. I had the same voice and I learned ceramics again in the same way, very lucidly, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Yeah. Welcome, welcome. Thank yeah, Tia, please continue. So, thank you, sir. Actually, uh, you know that uh, uh, General Assembly of the United Nations declared 2022 as the year of glass. So, we'll be ha having so many events on glass uh, to popularize the glass and to reach to the common right. masses. So possibly we will come 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 back to you again for your wonderful talk uh, for that program. And uh, I think if there is no question, so students can uh, directly write to him and uh, uh, he will be uh, very kind enough to answer your questions. Actually, I have also some questions, but I will write to you later. <laughs> right, sir. Okay. So okay. Uh, let us thank uh, Professor Bhargav uh, for this wonderful talk and uh, basically to apprising us the everlasting relationship between the humans and ceramics uh, from the early civilization and to the future to come. So this is an amazing talk and uh, we, we are spellbound completely. There is a question, so, small question. Shall I say something there? Uh, I see. Yes, uh, yeah, there is a question. Yeah. See, see a small question. So the green body, I know those of you who are new to this idea, of course, all our scientists here know it. But the green body refers to any body that you make out of ceramic powders into a shape and before it is heat treated or fired. Basically, that time it's very weak, not strong, right? Because the particles are just sitting together. That's a green body before firing. Okay, I guess that's it, yeah. Yeah, so it so is not I, essentially color. Color is not essentially green, but yeah, it's basically not <laughs> it's unfired, not fired yet. <laughs> That's to right. densify. Sure. So I think uh, uh, we can now. I would now request uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. Shubhadeep Bodo, he is a sincere, uh, senior principal scientist of this institute, to deliver a formal vote of thanks. So, Shubhadeep, please. Uh, thank you, Atiyatha. Uh, I apologize, my uh, camera is not uh, working actually. So, let me read out here. Uh, so, uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, so, finally, we have come to an end of today's sixth virtual lecture series of CSIR Diggerson Student Scientist Connect program. Uh, though you wanted to organize this event in a physical mode, uh, however, uh, we are forced to organize it in a virtual mode considering the current pandemic situation. Uh, we are really very happy uh, that we could successfully organize today's event, and it has been only possible uh, due to the sincere support from everybody associated with this event. Uh, hence, it's my great privilege uh, to propose a vote of thanks. So first of all, I'd uh, like to thank uh, CSIR for giving us this great opportunity to host today's event. I convey my sincere thanks to Dr. Shuman Kumari Mishra, Director CGCRI, for kindly gracing today's event, delivering the opening remarks, and rendered continuous support and advice towards organizing CSIR Jigasa Student Scientist Connect program. I must mention our deep sense of appreciation for our, for our chief guest, Professor Dr. Parat Bhargav, for kindly accepting our invitation and delivering a very in, insightful lecture in today's sixth virtual lecture series. I sincerely thank C. Sitendu Mandal, Chief Scientist and Head of Specialty Glass Division and Jigasha Nodal for his con constant effort to make this program flawless. He motivated the whole team with minute to minute guidance and encouragement in the organization of this great event. I also convey my sincere thanks to Dr. K. Annapurna, Chief Scientist, Specialty Glass Division for her introductory remarks and Dr. Atiya Robin Mulla for moderating today's event. I also express our gratitude to all the participants, including respected teachers from different schools across our state, and most importantly, our beloved students who have been the motivation of this event. Last but not the least, I also wish to sincerely thank all the core team members of JIGASA program, including Dr. P. K. Shina, Dr. Koushik Bishash, Dr. Devdula Shaha, Dr. Anivan Dhar, Dr. Shaurabh Nag, Sri Somjati Boshak, along with our colleagues from IT Division, Sri Ogni Badigari, and everybody who has been associated with this event for this their tireless contribution in making today's event a grand success. So with this, again, I'd like to thank all of you on behalf of the organizing committee. Stay safe and stay healthy. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you.
thank you so much subodeep uh, for a wonderful vote of thanks uh, all the school all the schools are basically requested to send your feedback so that we, we can improve upon this uh, and come back with a better program in the future so the session is closed now uh, thank you all and have a great time ahead thank you so much thank you so much thanks for okay. that Thank you, thank, thank you, you, and thank, thank you, Doctor Shitendu Mandal. You were always in touch with me, you know, for everything, and yeah, yeah, I made everything comfortable. So thank you, everybody. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. And uh, this, as I told you, that this is just an initiation. We are not leaving you. You will be now. Your entry is started now for the, uh, the all the programs uh, till the completion of Azadi ka uh, Amrit Mahotsav program is finished. Okay. So you'll be there with us. Thank you, sir, so much for your continuous support. Thank you, sir. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Stay well. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Bye-bye.